My name is Emily Roxworthy. Uh, welcome to uh, Animal Conservation and Civil Discourse, a panel discussion um, that is uh, inspired in part um, by UC San Diego's principles of community, which are pictured here on the slide, in particular two that are very relevant to today's discussion, championing freedom of expression and resolving conflict constructively. These are taken from uh, the Warren College Avenue banners that are out on Warren Mall. Um, today's event is also part of the Academe Awards for Principles of Community, an annual event where we hand out uh, burls, kind of like Oscars except burls. It's, of course, a combination of the rock bear statue outside the auditorium and our college namesake, Earl Warren. Today's event was also inspired by a t February 2010 UCLA event entitled the UCLA Panel on Science and Ethics of Animal Research. It was organized by neuroscientist Dario Ringach, who in his words wanted to show that we could hold a civilized discussion on the topic of animal-based research. He was desperate to combat extremist attitudes among some activists who had threatened his children because of his animal-based research and had detonated a bomb in a colleague's car. The 2010 UCLA panel had three speakers on each side of the debate. On the side favoring animal-based research were two neuroscientists and a philosopher, and on the other side was an activist, a history professor, and another philosopher opposing animal research. As Dr. Ringach put it, our goal was to bring to uh, the panel individuals with a range of positions. One of the misperceptions is that people segregate into these binary positions, that we either support all types of animal-based research or we condemn everything, and it's not true. People hold a continuum of, view, of views on this issue. Six experts had 15 minutes each to share their perspectives, and then there was an hour for the audience to pose questions. The moderator was David Lazarus of the LA Times. Lazarus is a proud donor to the ASPCA, but also an individual directly benefiting from animal research with an insulin pump for his diabetes. So Lazarus declared himself to be a living embodiment of the debate. That panel was deemed a success and was written up in Nature and Science magazines. We're seeking a similar dialogue today that capitalizes on our location in San Diego with a major research university in UCSD, two major zoological organizations, the San Diego Zoo Global and SeaWorld, as well as today's visit by actress turned animal conservation activist Shannon Elizabeth, seated directly to my left. So today we will follow the 10 ground rules listed on this slide, and you have these on the handout as well that you received along with an index card. The first rule that we've all agreed to follow is to seek to understand, not to be right. In Civil Discourse in the Classroom, Kate Schuster writes that our society is currently dominated by a loudest is best approach, which is created by media outlets and 24-hour news cycles, which is anti-democratic because only the loudest gets heard, and shouting is antithetical to collaboration and innovation. Schuster maintains that ed educators are well positioned to provide a counterweight to this loudest is best approach, and today's panel seeks to instill this counterweight around the difficult issue of animal conservation. The second rule is that we will um, respect one, I'm sorry, it's not in the order that's on the slide there, sorry. The second rule is that we'll assume the best intent of others and have patience with them. In negotiating the impossible, how to break deadlocks and resolve ugly conflicts, Deepak Malhotra of the Harvard Business School writes that in negotiations of all kinds, the greater your capacity for empathy, the more carefully you try to understand all of the other party's motivations, interests, and constraints, the more options you tend to have for potentially resolving the dispute or deadlock. In other words, when you empathize, you are not doing others a favor, you're doing yourself a favor. Your political opponents almost certainly believe that they are the ones doing what is best. When you fail to explore their perspectives, you're unlikely to de-escalate the conflict, find common ground, help each other address core concerns, or think creatively about how each side's interests might be met. So empathy expands the set of options you have for resolving conflict and reaching agreement. Our third ground rule will be to aim for a spirit of hospitality in which everyone feels invited to participate. In discussion as a way of teaching tools and techniques for democratic classrooms, Stephen Brookfield and Stephen Preskill write that when you create a hospitable environment, quote, the conviviality and congeniality that prevail encourage people to take risks and to reveal strongly held opinions. Our fourth rule is to approach the discussion with humility. This means we have to acknowledge that others in the room have ideas that might teach us something new. Brookfield and Preskill write that discussion is a way of talking that emphasizes the inclusion of the widest variety of perspectives and a self-critical willingness to change what we believe if convinced by the arguments of others. We must be willing to admit that one's knowledge and experience are limited and incomplete and to act accordingly. It is being willing to see all others in the group as potential teachers. 
The fifth rule is to respect one another's views. Schuster writes that civil discourse is discourse that supports rather than undermines the societal good. The sixth rule is to criticize ideas, not individuals. According to rhetoric professor Chris Lundberg, quote, the idea of civility does not mean politeness. It originates in Cicero with the concept of societis civilis. What it meant was that there are certain standards of conduct toward others and that members of the civil society should comport themselves in a way that sought the good of the city. Our seventh rule will be to avoid blame and speculation. Malhotra writes that empathy is needed most with those who seem to deserve it least. Most of us see ourselves as being relatively understanding and empathetic, but we fail to act this way when we are dealing with people who have done things that we find abhorrent or inexplicable. Yet these are precisely the situations that require empathy most. You already understand your friends. The key to resolving conflict lies in understanding your enemies. The eighth rule will be to avoid inflammatory language. Communication professor Thomas Hollihan writes that to engage in a healthy political argument is to acknowledge the possibility that one's own arguments could be falsified or proven wrong. This demands that citizens listen carefully and respectfully to the claims made by others. Name calling, threats, and bullying behaviors do not meet the demands of effective deliberation. And finally, opinions must be supported by evidence. That's our ninth ground rule. As Schuster puts it, there's a difference between an opinion and an argument. An opinion is an expression of preference. It does not require any support, although it is stronger with support. An opinion is only the first part of an argument. The second part is reasoning. The third part, of course, is evidence. And then finally, we will be uh, submitting in, uh, questions on index cards to allow for solicitation. You each should have received a handout with these ground rules and an index card, um, and you'll be queued um, at some point during the discussion to hand those um, to the aisles to your side so that um, they can be passed up to me. All right. Uh, on display throughout today's panel will be wildlife artwork by Mr. Alex Sinclair, a 1991 graduate of UCSD's Warren College in Studio Art. Um, he's worked as a comic book colorist um, for 25 years for DC Comics. He's the recipient of our Distinguished Alumni Award at the Burles. Um, he's also a uh, renowned wildlife artist at the San Diego Zoo where he teaches his other passion, drawing and painting wildlife art. And that's why you heard DC Comics uh, music when you came in is uh, in his honor. All right, so let me introduce our panelists. Shannon Elizabeth, seated to my left, was born in Houston, Texas, the daughter of a Syrian Lebanese father and a mother who is English, Irish, and German. When Shannon was in third grade, her family moved to Waco, Texas, where most of her relatives already lived. And as a girl, she took dance lessons, including tap, ballet, and jazz. During high school, she was active in tennis, cheerleading, dance team, and student council. And as a senior, Shannon was in a music video shot in Waco. The music artists were local ones named High Five, and the director of that video just happened to be Antoine Fuqua. After graduating, Shannon moved to New York City to model and then traveled the world with her newfound career, but she has, had always wanted to start acting and had only modeled in hopes that it could lead her into an acting career. After about a year of living in Los Angeles, she started taking acting coaches with several different coaches, got an agent, and in 1999 landed the iconic role of Nadia in the film American Pie. Since then, Shannon has starred in many film and television projects, including Scary Movie, 13 Ghosts, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, That 70s Show, and the film Love Actually. And of course, she was just a member of the cast of the first ever US celebrity Big Brother on CBS. Shannon's other love, and what she refers to as her true mission in life, is her nonprofit, Animal Avengers. Founded in 2001 as a Los Angeles dog and cat rescue, the charity became international in 2015 after Shannon became increasingly aware of the poaching crises affecting many of Africa's endangered species. Following her calling, Shannon moved to Africa to be on the front line of creating awareness and raising support for several worthy causes. Her current project, Rhino Review, is the first brand to be launched under the newly formed NGO Wildlife Review Foundation. The foundation is set to become a globally recognized epicenter of credible, objective, accessible, and consistently updated information on specific environmental or wildlife challenges. By working with many of the world's leading NGOs, conservation programs, and industry thought leaders, the foundation seeks to be a recognized leader in conservation education by providing content to all levels of students, better informing corporate and philanthropic offices to better direct donor dollars to most deserving of programs on the ground. To sign up for newsletters and information about the launch of Rhino Review, please visit and register at rhinoreview.org. Shannon currently splits her time between Cape Town, South Africa, and the US. To Shannon's left is Pascal Gagnon. 
who is an associate professor of pathology, the Division of Comparative Pathology and Medicine, and associate professor of anthropology at UC San Diego. He's interested in the evolutionary mechanisms responsible for generating and maintaining primate molecular diversity. His team is exploring the roles of molecular diversity in protecting populations from pathogens, as well as potential consequences, oops, I forgot to advance this slide, potential consequences for reproductive compatibility. The Gagnon Laboratory studies cell surface molecules of sperm cells in closely related primate species. His focus is on glycans, the oligosaccharides, this is where I just get into tongue twisters, oligosaccharides attached to glycolipids and glycoproteins of the cell surface. The numerous parallels between the surface molecules of successful pathogens and those found on the surface of mammalian sperm invite the analogy between internal fertilization and, quote, extremely successful infection, end quote. Dr. Gagnon's interest is in how differences in sperm surface molecules reflect sexual selection via sperm con competition and cryptic female choice, and whether such differences might contribute to reproductive incompatibility and speciation due to female immune rejection of sperm decorated with incompatible glycoconjugates. I know what all of that meant, in case you're wondering. <laughs> the operating assumption is that glycan evolution is shaped by constraints from endogenous biochemistry and exogenous pathogen-mediated natural selection, but could also have consequences for sexual selection. Dr. Gagno has studied the behavioral ecology of wild chimpanzees in the Thai forest, Ivory Coast, population genetics of Western African, of West African chimpanzees, and differences in sialic acid biology between humans and great apes, with special consideration of their differing pathogen regimes. His current concern is that the current, his great concern is that the current surge in interest for comparative genomics is not being translated into direct support for the conservation of primates in their endangered natural habitats. To Pascal's left is Dr. Judy St. Ledger, who has worked for SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment for nearly 20 years. Her current title is Vice President for Research and Science. Her position involves animal disease investigations for wildlife and collection animals, as well as overseeing research efforts with external professionals interested in studying about the animals held in SeaWorld Parks and those of the wildlife rescue programs. Many of her collaborators are affiliated with San Diego institutions, such as UCSD and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, San Diego State University, and the University of San Diego. Additionally, she serves on the board of SeaWorld Bush Gardens Conservation Fund and is the president of a nonprofit organization promoting reef conservation. She serves on the boards and scientific review boards of other nonprofits dedicated to enhancing education and conservation. Dr. St. Ledger has a long history of promoting education in wildlife pathology to better understand individual animals, populations, and the role of wildlife in the global context. Her commitment to wildlife includes a focus on habitat protection and preservation. To Judy's left is John Hildebrand, professor of oceanography at Scripps Institution of Oceanography here at UCSD. He's associated with the Marine Physical Laboratory at Scripps and is an adjunct professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His research focuses on using sound to study marine mammals and the impact of anthropogenic sound in the ocean. Hildebrand's lab has developed a high-frequency acoustic recording package, or HARP, that is capable of long-term acoustic monitoring in remote ocean locations. These instruments are currently deployed in the Arctic, near Hawaii, off the coast of Washington and California, and in the Gulf of Mexico. HARPs have revealed new information on the behaviors and seasonal migrations of whales and dolphins. For instance, by examining the songs of blue whales, dialects were discovered that helped to discriminate distinct regional populations. Hildebrand's work also has documented that ocean noise levels from commercial shipping have increased dramatically over the past few decades, raising concern about the potential impact of ocean noise on marine mammals. Hildebrand was born here in San Diego. He received his BS in physics and electrical engineering from UC San Diego's Warren College and a PhD in applied physics from Stanford University. He held a research position at SIO before joining the Scripps faculty and has served on the Marine Mammal Com Commission's Board of Scientific Advisors and as a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America. He's also a member of the Society for Marine Mammalogy and the author or co-author of more than 150 scientific publications. To John's left is Sherman De Silva, president and founder of Trunks and Leaves Incorporated, a nonprofit focused on evidence-based conservation of Asian elephants and their habitats. She obtained her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, studying the behavioral ecology and demography of Asian elephants, and directs the Udawalawe, sorry if I mispronounced that, Elephant Research Project in Sri Lanka, which she initiated in 2005. She's an assistant project scientist at UC San Diego and a research fellow at the San Diego Zoo Global. 
She also serves on the Asian Elephant Specialist Group of the IUCN Species Survival Commission and the board of the Asia section of the Society for Conservation Biology as communications officer. She is also the founder and trustee of EFFECT Sri Lanka. She previously held postdoctoral fellowships at the Smithsonian Institution, the College of Life Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin, and Colorado State University in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. Sherman received her BA in 2002 from UC Berkeley with a double major in Integrative Biology and Philosophy. To Sherman's left is Gustav Roy, a professor in the section of Ecology, Behavior, and Evolution in the Division of Biological Sciences. He got his undergraduate degree in India and his PhD from the University of Chicago. He has been on the UC San Diego faculty since 1995. Research in the Roy Lab is focused on better understanding the processes that generate and maintain large-scale biodiversity gradients in the ocean and how such gradients are being impacted by climate change and other anthropogenic impacts. And he has the shortest biography of today's panelists. And finally, Oliver A. Ryder is the Clayburg Director of Conservation Genetics at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. He oversees research activities in molecular genetics, cytogenetics, cell culture, and cryobanking. He guides the strategic development and applications of the unique resource of cell cultures in the frozen zoo, enabling notable scientific contributions to conservation and other biological disciplines. Dr. Ryder has contributed to key studies relevant to conservation management efforts for numerous endangered species. He, he participates in um, developing studies that link conservation efforts for small managed populations, such as held in zoos, with larger landscape scale efforts for wild populations. He's one of the three co-organizers of the Genome 10K project that aims to sequence the genomes of 10,000 vertebrate species to reveal genetic changes that produce their remarkable diversity and to apply this knowledge to be better stewards of life on our planet. Dr. Ryder received a BA in biology from UC Riverside, a PhD in biology from UC San Diego. He's an adjunct professor in the Department of Evolution, Behavior, and Ecology here at UCSD. Uh, he's also a AAAS fellow recognized for contributions to understanding and conserving genetic diversity. His scientific achievements in wild animal health were recognized by receiving the Duane Ulrey Award from the American Association for Zoo Veterinarians. He has contributed to the development of the fields of conservation genetics, conservation genomics, and emerging efforts in genetic rescue using advanced genetic and reproductive technologies. His extensive bibliography lists more than 300 publications, including several citation classics. Okay, so now you don't have to hear much from me um, because I'm now going to pose a series of four questions to our panelists. They've received these questions in advance. So instead of giving each of them 15 minutes um, to present their case, um, as was done at UCLA in 2010, they'll take turns uh, in answering these four questions. The first one, they have the longest to answer, so they have up to five minutes. And I will stop them if they uh, start to go over that, just in the interest of time. Um, so our first question is, what is your guiding philosophy of humans' responsibility to conserve non-human animal populations? And how does this philosophy guide your work? And we'll start uh, with Ms. Elizabeth. Hi, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, as far as a guiding philosophy, I, I believe that the reason that we need to help and protect animals is because we're the ones that are destroying them, that are affecting them. If you look at an ecosystem um, that is completely untouched, um, whatever, you believe in as far as a god, whatever put it there, it is perfect without us doing anything to it. It thrives without our intervention. Um, the animals are perfect as they are. They only have issues when we come in and we start taking the land for ourselves, our greed, when we start destroying the animals, we start killing them for trophies, for meat, whatever it may be. So because we are going in and affecting them in this way, we must be the ones to go in and save them. Um, land is a very big thing in conservation, protecting this land so that they can thrive. And the larger the piece of land, the less intervention it needs from us. Because if you can have that complete ecosystem on that land, it is perfect. So um, in, in the work that I do, it has become very much about finding pieces of land, working with people who are conserving land and protecting animals within that land. My nonprofit Animal Avengers started as a dog and cat rescue in Los Angeles in 2001. 
And after running it that way for 10 years, I realized that I wanted to help more animals in a much bigger way. And I didn't know what that quite looked like yet until I started becoming aware of the poaching crisis going on all over the world. But my focus became Africa. Um, I was seeing videos and, and pictures of elephants and rhino with their faces being chopped off. Um, the, the elephants, their, their, um, their body parts would be spread all over the ground and they would actually still be alive quite often and just crying out for help. And this was all because humans went in there and wanted to take their ivory. And with the rhinos, they're taking their horns and it's quite often going to um, Eastern countries where the belief is it has medicinal value or the ivory is being made into trophies, um, to chess pieces. Um, the, the rhino horn is being given as a show of good faith in a business meeting um, that the deal will go through. Uh, none, of, none of this should be happening. And these animals, they, they have their families, they have their babies, they love, they have the capacity to mourn. Um, those that pass within their family units. And we're going in and destroying them because we want to, because we're greedy, because we think it's fun, because there are trophy hunters out there that, that think it's fun and they like to say, well, hunting is conservation, but that money is not going into the land. It's not going into saving the animals. It's going into somebody's pocket that will quite often take them on a hunt that's quite illegal. Even though you might have a permit, it may not be for the animal that you're killing. And the permit system is very flawed and there's lots of corruption. And um, so, now, so now the work that I'm trying to do, when I started going to Africa, it was learning about these issues, uh, learning about human wildlife conflict that is happening on surrounding areas where where there may be protection within a park, but then these animals don't know not to leave that park, that that's the safe zone. So finding ways to work with communities and put things in place that help protect those animals in a very humane way so those communities don't kill them just because an elephant is trampling your crops. Um, one of the foundations that I work with through Animal Avengers is called the Rhino Pride Sanctuary, Rhino Pride Foundation. and what, um, what they will do is go pick up a baby rhino when the mother's been poached. Um, they'll, they'll drive for days to go pick this baby up, bring her back to the foundation, and you have to start getting her used to humans now, which should never be happening because I don't believe that we should be interfering with these wild animals unless it's a, it's a situation like this where we have to now save them because of ourselves. So now you bring this baby back and you try to convince the baby that the same humans they just saw kill their mother is now going to feed them and raise them and take care of them and save them. And how do you convince a little baby of this? And this is some of the work that they're doing there. And some of what we have done is help um, pay for their security around the parameters of this property to try to protect this land, to try to protect these animals. Um, in hopes that they can breed and one day go back into the wild, in hopes of raising that population. Um, black rhinos, we have less than 5,000. White rhinos, there's less than 20. Um, and there's, there's other species of rhinos that are even less. I mean, some less than 500. So the work um, that, that you can do to help these animals is really imperative because they're going very quickly. And with elephants, we're losing on average 99 elephants a day to poaching. It's four to six rhinos a day, 99 elephants a day. So anything that can be done to conserve land, to, to not interfere with these animals and let them live the way they're meant to live, that's what's going to keep the, our ecosystem going. And we're part of a chain. And when you start demolishing any, any animal, the, where you're taking out the entire species, you're taking out part of that chain of that ecosystem, and you don't know what link in the chain makes the whole thing collapse. Okay. And it will affect climate, it will affect us, it'll start with the communities that it's close to, and it'll trickle outward. So people here that say, well, how does it affect me? It does affect you. 
Right. And it, you may not feel it right away, but it will affect you, and we're seeing it in climate change. We're seeing it all over the world now, so I find it very important. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, Pascal, your turn. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so it strikes me as humans, we have a very bipolar view of, of non-human life. I, I love cats and dogs. I love chimpanzees and giraffes, but I really hate malaria and giardia. I'm a zoologist at a medical school, and until very recently, until the appreciation that things like the microbiome might actually be good for you, medical schools had a stated goal of destroying many life forms because they were making us sick. And so that strikes me as a difficulty that on the one hand, it's clear that we are now become the dominant life form on the planet. Most ecosystems are affected by us. There might not be the wild anymore because climate change is affected the most wildest places. So it is absolutely clear that we are an ecological disaster, whether we have a responsibility from some higher power or we choose the responsibility, I don't even know. But even from a selfish point of view, utilitarian, if we don't want to die out, we better do something about the disaster we are. I think there is some hope, because one thing that allowed us to colonize the planet the way we have is that humans can be incredibly cooperative. We, are v we can be very nasty animals, but we can also be more cooperative than any other species ever documented. Little kids like to help just for the fun of helping. There's something in our biology that makes us feel good when we help somebody else. And I see some hope there that in realizing that we've become an ecological disaster, killing many species, some of them in a very targeted way because we like their horns or their tusks, something in our culture makes us believe that these animal parts are better and so we you know we hire people to go and track down these animals and exterminate them but the problem is is vast it affects you know the insects have gone down dramatically all across europe a combination of pesticides and and uh, encroachment of our way of life so when I try to think about how we could improve these things, I, I often get ashamed because I live here. I, I'm, I'm Swiss originally. I moved to the U.S. 25 years ago. And most of us here use at least 100 times more electricity and 200 times more petroleum or fuels, gasoline, than someone living in Tanzania where these elephants and these uh, rhinos live, some of them with 24-7 guards next to them with a Kalashnikov trying, and, you know, they're chipped and everything, but they still get killed. It creates a problem for us. I think we are rightly, we should be concerned about wildlife in places like Africa and Asia, but we live here and our footprint on this planet is gigantic. So when we go to places or when we engage with people who live in places in Africa with a per capita consumption 100 times lower in electricity, 200 times lower in fuel, we should treat very carefully and never forget that we are the elephant in the room, so to speak, in regards to the impact on the planet and on things like climate change. So I'm you know, urgently trying to educate myself as for better ways to start conversation with people who deal with elephants that raid their cr crops or chimpanzees that destroy their cocoa harvest uh, of an entire year. It doesn't take that many chimpanzees to destroy your cocoa crop. And if you're a farmer, show me a farmer who doesn't get very, I garden here, I get really upset at aphids. You know, I love aphids biologically, they're fantastic. But when they eat my, you know, my, my onions right now have aphids, it's outrageous. I get nasty and I don't respect them for what they are, a part of the ecosystem. So I try to never forget that I bear a disproportionate burden of what humans are doing to the planet. But that doesn't mean I don't try to to talk to people who live in countries where my beloved giraffes live, for example. Judy. I and many of my colleagues are really uh, guided by a strong commitment to animals and the environment. I think that all animals, humans included, uh, deserve consideration. Free-ranging animals need a place to live. They need the ability to get food, to interact with themselves and their environment. And when we as humans negatively impact them through actions like poaching, they need us to step in and fix the mess we made. We don't run this world. And as you said, unfortunately, we're running this world into the ground. 
I think that we all need to act locally, act, lo act locally, and think globally, and think about how we can act globally as well. So when folks say, well, what is SeaWorld doing to make a difference? SeaWorld's doing a lot. Many of you know that we have the local animal rescue programs. The program that we have here in San Diego has, over its existence, uh, rescued and rehabilitated over 20,000 animals. Now, I haven't been involved in 20,000 rescues or rehab actions, but certainly when we think about that number, it's not an insig insignificant number. The kind of animals we respond to are the local wildlife, so seals, sea lions, endangered fur seals, sometimes dolphins, whales, sea turtles, even seabirds. Basically, we're committed to using our ability to help animals to help the local wildlife. But as we've discussed, the problem of conservation isn't just local. It's certainly a bigger picture. So in my role at SeaWorld on a day-to-day -day basis, one of the things I do is work with conservation research. I work with a number of governmental and NGO organizations to answer questions that need to be answered to help free-ranging populations in ways we can only answer them with captive animals. So an example of this is some work we did with some local researchers where we took overhead photo images of killer whales. And you think, what the heck value is there in actions like that? Well, the model that was designed with those overhead images is now used with drone surveillance of free-ranging killer whales. One of the questions that the biologist had is, how do we tell if a killer whale is pregnant? Well, we took photo images of two animals at SeaWorld that were pregnant during their pregnancy. And now by the shape of the animal, just as many pregnant animals have a different body shape, it's the same thing with killer whales. They can now identify pregnant killer whales in the free-ranging populations. Well, five years ago, the way to do that was to see a killer whale with a baby by its side. But if you want to know sort of the reproductive success of a population, you don't just need to look at babies, you need to look at moms. SeaWorld also understands sort of our limitations. We can't be everywhere and deal with all the conservation issues. So over 11 years ago, we started the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund. This is a, a conservation fund process that each year gives away over a million dollars to organizations outside of SeaWorld committed to animal conservation. And the kind of projects that are supported include things like the rescue and rehab of penguins in Cape Town through SANCOB, uh, an important organization there, to a multi-agency program uh, to develop the next generation of wildlife leaders. We all need to do our part in conservation, and we need to understand that the conservation we have to do is because humans have sadly created many of the problems that face the globe today. Thank you. John. So, um, so I, I want to take a long-term perspective on the question, and, and that if you go back, you know, the Earth has been here for a long time, you know, billions of years, and the life that we see on the Earth has evolved, and the geologists divide the history of the Earth into these epochs. And epochs are really where you see a dramatic change in the kind of, of uh, life that's on Earth. Life is our key way of seeing these boundaries. And there have been times where there's a really dramatic change in the kind of life that's here on Earth. And so, for instance, one that perhaps most of you have heard about is at the end of the Cretaceous, where the Earth is dominated by dinosaurs, there's an impact from an asteroid that pretty much wipes dinosaurs out, but, but opens up a niche for mammals, which is maybe why we're sitting in this auditorium today, right, as opposed to being some T-Rexes discussing the same topic. <laughs> so, um, so at any rate, you know, there is this long process, and species do come and go, and most of these boundaries we don't know exactly what happened, but some event, volcanic, you know, asteroid impact, maybe even some combination of the, the uh, plants and animals. In, a, in other words, in the early history of, of plants, a lot of CO2, plants take CO2 out of the atmosphere, can sequester it, 
in the era where there were plants pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, but no microbes that would decay the plants, then so much CO2 came out that the Earth went into a deep freeze. And then as the microbes developed, then the CO2 could go back into the air. I mean, there's an example of unintended consequences of, of plants being developed. But um, the point now is people have discussed the current uh, geologic epoch as being the Anthropocene. And that's saying that we now are the dominant factor, that we are creating a boundary between what came before and what's going forward. That our impact on the planet is so great that if you come back in 100 million years, you'll see a geologic boundary based on our behavior. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we really want to be seen in the light of, you know, this was as bad as an asteroid impact mm -hmm. or, you know, volcanic eruptions that, that changed the atmosphere. So, so with this perspective, I don't think we can say that every species is precious because they do come and go, but that means we're not precious either. And we're liable to be part of this same cycle. And maybe our own doing, you know, will we'll do us in. So, so I think we need to have a perspective that, you know, we really don't want to be the dominant impact on the planet. But, but you can't say that things won't change. You know that things will change. But, but I would like to say that we've at least tried our best not to be um, a horrible uh, scourge on the planet. Thank you. Sherman. So the risk of being, you know, when you're halfway down the table is that other people have already said <laughs> most of what you want to say. So what I want to say echoes several of the thoughts um, that people have said before. And starting with, you know, species have been evolving for millions of years. They'll go on evolving and they've been going extinct for millions of years and they'll keep going extinct. So um, where I come from um, and where I think, you know, we really have to ask ourselves why we do this, it, um, you know, it's when we're responsible. So when we're the ones that are responsible for species going extinct. And then we have to ask ourselves, is that really necessary for our well-being? And getting back to the you know, pathogens example, you know, if, I think hardly anyone would object to some mos disease-bearing mosquito somewhere going extinct. In fact, we might actively try to do that. We might actively try to eradicate vermin, right? Um, once upon a time, you know, we call rats vermin, but once upon a time, elephants were ver vermin, and people tried to eradicate them so that they could, you know, make plantations and, um, you know, develop their economies and make profits, and and this and this goes on, and so it's a matter of perspective. So, um, he, so we we all have to ask ourselves, you know, we can't save everything, and as John said, every, you know, things come and go. So, what do we focus on? And um, there's a, you know there's everything else there's all the charismatic species that people care about and why do people care about those species well for me personally um, a slightly different take than you know what you might hear otherwise you know we can talk about their functions we can talk about their their utility in the ecosystems and the roles that they play and all of that but for me personally lately I'm thinking that um, the deepest reason for me is that um, they are literally our brothers and sisters so you know, I'm a biologist, and we all have common ancestry. And life on Earth is really the greatest story on Earth. Um, and there's nothing greater and the story of evolution. So for me, personally, I mean, I can't do it all. I'm one individual and in a very, very tiny nonprofit compared to everyone else that's up here. Um, I have to choose, and I choose to focus on a particular species that I, ha I happen to care about. And um, and I think the world would be a very lonely place without all of these other species in them. And that fundamentally is why I do what I do, just so that that story can continue for that one species, or you know, however many that we happen to work on. And that one species for me is elephants. Um, I work on Asian elephants because I come from um, a country that takes elephants for granted. I grew up in Sri Lanka, and they've always been a big part of the culture there. Elephants, unfortunately, have been in captivity there for many, many years for thousands of years in, the, in, in all of Southeast Asia and in South Asia. And so growing up, I really took elephants for granted. I didn't know that anything, there was anything special about them until pretty much much later in life when I came over here and 
um, you know, when I learned that Asian elephants are actually endangered, and there's actually 10, 10, there's only 10% as many Asian elephants as there are African elephants. So there are 10 times more African elephants um, out there in the world than Asian elephants. They're much, much more endangered. And, but they kind of get taken for granted because you see them so much in captivity. You see them in zoos. You see them in, in you know, people ride them. And um, they get called domesticated. So that's, there's a fair amount of confusion about you know, elephants being wild animals. People don't really re realize that Asian elephants are actually wild animals. Um, so all of that understanding came to me fairly late, um, which motivated me to find out more. And then since I'm Sri Lankan, it made sense that I go back and work in Sri Lanka, as, which is what I do now. And so I started off with a sort of basic interest in behavior and the study of um, animal behavior and you know, sort of animal communication. And now I'm going more in the direction of trying to understand the people who live with elephants, because we can talk about um, the need to conserve and we can make sort of academic arguments, but empathy is really key. And to, we have to really understand what those people are going through that have to live with an animal like an elephant every day that risk you know, their children being killed by elephants or losing an entire year's crops to elephants and their issues. So um, we are taking baby steps in my context to try to understand that and, and figure out solutions that are appropriate to that context. So that's where I'm going, and I take, take each step as it comes. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Kostov. The shortest bio was not uh, an accident, it was by design, because unlike my fellow panelists, I work on teeny tiny things in the ocean. Uh, I don't work on charismatic species, I work with marine invertebrates, and more recently we work with microbes. And if you think about it, and if you know a little bit of ecology, you know that this is where 99% of biodiversity is. This is where all the species are. And more importantly, if you really think about it, um, you cannot have functioning ecosystems without invertebrates. And if you take it one step further, you cannot have a functioning habitable pl pl uh, planet without microbes. Um, it's that simple. Yet, we know very little about what's going on with these organisms and you know what are the consequences for these microbial communities and invertebrate communities in the ocean in, in response to any, anything from climate change to human harvesting to all of these other things, urbanization, all these other things we do. So our, you know, our philosophy is, is rooted more in the science of trying to understand how these systems work. Um, if you think about it, um, an ecosystem, any ecosystem we study, is a complex machine. And each species within that ecosystem serves a purpose that have evolved over millions of years. And in an analogy to an engine, these are the little parts that make the whole engine go. And if you take one of these little parts, you may not see the whole system, whole engine stop, but if you take enough of these, it will stop. And we have no way to replace these parts. So, you know, our, and, and we also take a very um, practical approach in that um, we, we know that we live in a planet with all sorts of impacts, and these impacts aren't going away anytime soon. Uh, by mid-century, the projections are the planet's gonna have about 10 billion of us. Uh, the 10 billion people have to be fed. Um, they will need resources. The trend is towards urbanization. We like to live in cities, and there's many, many good things about living in cities. But urbanization has its own set of challenges that come um, to ecosystems. And so our goal is to try to understand the, the integration of all of these different stressors are affecting these, both the ecosystems as well as individual components of these ecosystems, so that we can try to come up with a more evidence-based predictive model of where we can put our efforts in trying to protect things. Um, unlike, you know, megafauna, terrestrial vertebrates, the IUCN red list, which is our guiding principle for most of uh, conservation, it doesn't really exist in the ocean uh, outside of coral reefs and a small proportion of the fish diversity, the IUCN has not evaluated the vast majority of species out there. And you know, microbes are not even on, on the IUCN radar screen because we, we don't know enough of them to, to know. So that's where we, we are at this point is it's, it's more of trying to come up with a scientific evidence-based framework that could then guide policy as to where we put the resources in 
to try to manage a system that is going is already under immense stress and it is going to uh, it, it sounds terrible to say it but the pragmatic vision of it at least in the next 20 30 years the stressors are going to be there and we have to manage these ecosystems um, in the face of these stressors That's great. thank you Oliver thank you Wow it's neat to hear all of these things my philosophy derives from a consideration of the origin of life, like, so like cosmolo cosmological things. Cosmologies vary across cultures and across time, but a commonality is a sense of awe and a connection with the mystical or the sacred. So even for Charwin, Charles Darwin, who he, he closed the first the last paragraph of the first edition of The Origin of Species, saying, there is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravi gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. So this is a non-theistic view of uh, the d production of life, but there are many uh, theistic views, and deity abounds in these. In 1693, William, Quake, William Penn, the Quaker who founded Pennsylvania, said, it would go a long way to caution and direct people in their use of the world that they were better, better studied and knowing in the creation of it. Contemporary Quakers say, we humans belong to the whole interdependent community of life on earth. Rejoice in the beauty, in the, pff, rejoice in the beauty, complexity, and mystery of creation with gratitude to be part of its unfolding. Take time to learn how this community of life is organized and how it interacts live according to principles of right relationship and right action with this larger, within this larger whole. And very moving to me, and the last quotation you'll hear, um, was a statement at the, as you exit an exhibit at the National Museum of the American Indian called, Our Universes, Traditional Knowledge Shapes Our Lives. And it was a quote from an elder of the Santa Clara Pueblo, Tessie Naranjo. Our elders have created for us a sacred way of being in the universe. It is our responsibility to pass this understanding on to the next generation. And I reflected that I don't consider when I was a child I was exposed to the notion that there's a sacred way of being in the universe. But I think it's a good thing to practice. And I think were we to do that, we would change our relationship with nature and would be use our enormous power and intellect to be better stewards and to do the things that others have said here that can truly make a difference. Okay. Thank you. All right, our second question, and we'll start again with Shannon, is from your perspective, what is the biggest challenge facing animal conservation efforts today? And you'll oh. each have a maximum, sorry, of two minutes. Okay, um, from my perspective, I think that corruption um, and lack of regulation, among many other things, but those are kind of the things that I'm focusing on, I feel like are the biggest challenges for protecting these animals. Um, and when I say corruption, it's not just government corruption, but also corruption within NGOs. There is a lot of help out there. There's a lot of money out there, but so often it's not getting to the ground. It's not getting to the animals. It's not putting, being put to good use. Um, if, if, we, if there was a way of taking everything that people are trying to do and making it count, we would see more progress. Um, and within regulations, we need governments to work with us. We need their help. We need the laws to help us 
in doing this type of work to help these animals because, you know, the U.S. is, uh, is second only to China in um, when we, we go to these countries and steal these exotic animals for animal trafficking, we bring them back to our country to have exotic pets in our home. We're doing that here at home. And as far as trophy hunting goes, we are the number one. US, US men are number one going over there and killing animals just for trophies. And we're allowing all of this to happen. If we could put laws in place that support the work that we're doing, that gets the money to the ground, it would make a huge difference for these animals. And this isn't even touching upon things like I had mentioned before about protecting our land, which is so important, um, and, uh, and, and giving a, a living animal a perceived value rather than a dead animal, which is all we seem to care about right now. Great. Thank you so much. Pascal. I would argue for one of the biggest um, problems being inequality, both locally and globally, also historically, including colonial history that led certain places to go to other places and start completely destroying the habitat to look for ores or uranium, you have it. So habitat destruction would be the second and often driven by inequality, poaching, very often driven by local inequality where rich people hand out AK-47s to poor people who get a little payback from shooting a, a, a big animal. I'm really worried about the nature deficit disorder in the big cities, places like Tokyo and LA where people don't experience nature. Why should they care about an animal if they're afraid of a, a honeybee or a cockroach? Uh, population numbers, human population numbers, not necessarily a, a topic often addressed because it includes very strong cultural values. Us, the ones that use all the electricity going to other places, telling people not to have babies, but then we have a multi billion industry of trying to make b babies artificially. Very complicated topic. And finally, the tendency, again, of us showing up in places, telling them, stop doing that, do this. We've been doing so for hundreds of years, not always very successful, successfully. Okay, thank you. Judy. I think the biggest challenge facing conservation today is actually human ignorance and apathy. Um, things happen when people care. And People don't care when they don't understand, and they can't understand if they're not taught. Um, I remember actually learning the foundation of that quote at the National Zoo uh, at one of the exit areas. And the fact is, the way people learn can vary a lot. But for you, a trip to South Africa made a major difference for African wildlife. Those kind of learning are important this is an educated group, but they're important for the global community. Education is critical and important. I won't lie. Where I work, we focus on local education. We have about 10 million people that come through the SeaWorld parks in any given year. All right, the company would want me to say over 10 million. But the fact is, those folks spend a day not 15 seconds looking at a tweet, not 30 seconds, but actually a full day, hopefully with their families, learning and experiencing animals and hopefully connecting in a way that really preps them to make a difference. It's these differences that individuals make because they're educated that we need for conservation. Because all of us here can have a specific focus or a local interest, but if we don't have more folks involved and committed, we can't get things done. And when you talk about, we can't expect you know, third world populations to have first world vision, views, and actions. It's very true. But by educating those populations, we can make a difference. Certainly, um, I know that the more we're educating folks, the more we can get them to focus on the global community as a bigger, important resource. And it's those kind of knowledge, consideration, and actions that are going to make a difference with conservation. Great. Thank you. John. So I think one of the biggest issues in terms of getting people to engage with issues of conservation is the idea of a shifting baseline. 
So um, if you go out and take a walk in the forest or go diving on a, on a reef, you'll see a certain situation today, but it's quite likely it would have been different if your father had gone out or your grandfather had gone out that, that things have changed. And things change on such a time scale that you, your personal experience doesn't extend back to the conditions you know, before human impact. So an example of this, we had a, a professor at uh, Scripps, Jeremy Jackson, who was looking at this issue and he would look at the size of fish that would come back for fishing contests. Well, here's a fishing contest, people would go out and the biggest fish gets a prize and it's been done for 50 years and the fish used to be this big and then they were this big and now they're this big. It's basically, you know, people, um, you know, fishing down the, the long-lived fish are all gone. So unless we have a baseline, we don't know what we've lost. And, and part of in my own work where I put um, monitoring systems into the ocean and mostly based on sound, but sound will tell you a lot about what organisms are there. I think we need right now to establish a baseline. We know so little about so many places on the planet and how rapidly they're changing. And if we knew more, then I think it would be easier to put our fingers on how is it changing and what do we need to do about it. Okay. Thank you. Sherman. Love to reiterate that quote that Judy mentioned uh, and say it in full. It goes, we'll uh, protect only what we love, we'll love only what we understand, and we'll understand only what we are taught. And that was by Baba Diom, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but a Senegalese environmentalist, mind you, not a Western one. Um, and yes, I, I think one of the biggest challenges is um, just the number, of, the sheer number of people there on Earth. That's a lot of people um, that need a lot of resources and our consumption habits and doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime soon. I think that is the number one problem. Things like climate change and everything else you can think of are just consequences of that one number one problem. Um, but in more practical terms, sitting where I am, um, this might not be something you hear very much, but it's actually the financing. It's having sustainable, long-term ways for conservation to pay for itself. And as much as we say we value conservation, um, it's still a very small number of people that, as you say, care. Um, and we aren't willing to pay for it. We might care about wildlife, but we're not willing to pay for it. And so despite decades and decades and decades of people working on this and talking about conservation or environment or what have you, um, the, the mechanisms for maintaining those life support systems or even just the wildlife in them, even the big charismatic ones, haven't been worked out. And that makes our jobs a lot more difficult. Um, that makes having a job <laughs> a lot more difficult and having those wildlife around a lot more difficult. We wouldn't even, be, we wouldn't even need to talk about you know, or debate about trophy hunting, for instance, if there was another way for conservation to pay for itself in those environments. So this is not just uh, you know, a, a practical issue. It's a very deep and fundamental problem with the way that we regard um, nature and how we value it. Thank you so much. Kassel. If you think about it, effective conservation needs effective policy. And if you read the history of conservation science, it's rooted in local policies. We were very good at enacting laws and policies that applied to a country or a part of a country. We were also very good at trying to manage individual threats, um, habitat loss, logging, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the ocean fishing. So you know, the history of conservation science is both local and regional and focusing on tackling individual threats. What has really changed now, and this and to me is the biggest challenge we face, is that essentially the threats are global. Um, if you think about it, the demand for shark fin, where live sharks are being killed just for their fin, comes not from those communities and those fisher people that are actually catching those sharks, but from somewhere else. Okay, Same thing with elephants. So the demand is global. And the stressors have multiplied, and more importantly, the stressors are interacting with each other to create these mega um, issues that we deal with. So 
It's not enough to give an example. It's not enough to deal with climate change by itself. You need to deal with climate change at one hand, but you also need to deal with resource exploitation on the other hand. And at the same time, the planet is becoming more and more urban, so urbanization comes into the mix. So we, as a global society, still are struggling with how to come up with policies that can manage the global commons. And this is particularly problematic for the oceans because if you think about it, you go outside the 200, 300 mile limits of individual countries, that belongs to everybody else. And other countries are coming in, they can do whatever they want. We don't have any policies that apply to these global commons. And I think that's the biggest threat for me. It's just we live in a global society, we live in a global village, so to speak, but we don't have policies that apply at that scale. Thank you. Oliver. Well, we've heard extinctions happen, and we're in an accelerated process of extinction now. And we're unlikely to really reverse that trend in a dramatic way, to, it won't be reversed, but it can be attenuated. There are things that we can do, and I think, one of, I think the, one of the biggest challenges is losing hope, feeling that there's a fatalism, and insulating ourselves from the anguish of seeing wildness and nature disappear. I feel I'm very fortunate, uh, you know, in having people come to me who want to be interns and so forth, who are passionate, intelligent, creative, and want to make a difference. And I think that that efforts need to be expanded to encourage people and create opportunities to see, to, to seek hopeful solutions. I had a chance to, I was thinking about this, and I remember in 1987, uh, just about this time of year, when the last wild California condor was captured mm -hmm. and taken out of the wild. And it created a sense of, of loss. And it was only undertaken because it was recognized that it was the only way to save the species from extinction. That animal that was taken out of the wild in 1987 was released back into the wild in 2012. And I got to be there and see that. I got to see condors flying in the sky again. And I'm very fortunate that I you know, get to participate in efforts to undertake some of these things. Now, not all of them are successful. We also I w we also added, we also have living cells in the frozen zoo from the last representative of a species of bird the from Maui, the member of the Hawaiian honeycreeper family, the Po'o'uli. So that was a uh, different experience, no, seeing the living cells of an animal and knowing it was extinct. That might have been the first species extinct species. No, it wasn't. There was already one other before. But. So I want to say that I think that we shouldn't lose hope and that we should think what the future would ask us to do. Imagine having your phone light up and being able to have a conversation with the future. What would they ask us to do? I think there were some, I don't think they would you know, they presumably, you know, would don't say, well, you know, drop everything you're doing, or they would, they would, they would make some intelligent suggestion about and say, what can you do? What can we do? There are things we can. I think one of the interesting challenges is to figure them out. Okay. Thank you so much. Our third question: Many conservation efforts require human intervention. 
including those that involve research and educational outreach. What steps do you take to evaluate the balance between human intervention, including animal captivity, and the potential harm done to various species through these practices? And we'll start with Shannon and two minutes maximum per panelist, please. Um, animals require human intervention because of human intervention. <clears throat> it's because we have gone and interfered with these animals, like I mentioned before, as an example of poaching, that we must go in and save the babies that are now affected by that because without their mothers there, they will die. Um, what I don't believe in is animals in captivity for human entertainment. Uh, quite often these animals are taken as babies from their parents. Sometimes their parents are killed so they can be taken. And they're brought here and put in cages or put somewhere that, they're, that we pay money to go see them, to ride them, riding an elephant. Do you, you know, you talked about, um, we, we think elephants are now domesticated because of the, the ability to ride them, but what you may not understand is what breaking an elephant is. And, you know, they will, they will take the elephant as a baby and may torture it for a year until it submits and just gives up and gives up on life. And now you are able to ride this elephant and you pay good money for it and you think you take these pictures and think it's great. Um, now, some would argue that research does play a critical role in conservation and maybe that's true, um, but it's, retrospective act it's a retrospective activity um, and it's not the reason for being um, when it comes to zoos or a place um, like SeaWorld, perhaps. Um, you know, if you want to study an animal's behavior, you need to study it in its natural habitat. We don't go and study human beings in a maximum security prison because obviously their behavior is going to be altered just as the animal's behavior is altered when they go through trauma, they're taken out of their natural habitat, they're taken away from their families and put in a different situation. So the research may be altered because of that, so it's not true research. And they, this research, it's been proven that a lot of it can be done in the wild. Now, if you're doing it on an animal that's been rescued, it may be a different situation, but when you're taking that animal um, and, and killing the family and taking it just, just for the reasons I've explained, that's something I'm, I'm very against, and I think there are other ways that it can be done. Thank you. Pascal. Thank you. So yes, wild animal in captivity are a huge paradox. Uh, I became a biologist, a zoologist, because of seeing animals in zoos. That's not a justification to continue keeping animals in zoos, but something magical happens when kids look at animals, not domesticated animals, wild animals in zoos, and, and smell them and hear them. You can't replace that with a TV. That brings up the huge question of, well, is it worth depriving these animals of their dignity? There is some part of their dignity that is clearly gone when you see a captive great ape slam against a metal door instead of just getting up and walking away because it can't be bothered being followed by you. Uh, I don't have a solution for that. I, I, I think in an ideal world there might be certain species that are, you know, it would be less problematic to, to keep them captive so that you can organize encounters between these very same kids that suffer from nature deficit disorder and these amazing animals. Other species simply might have no place in a zoo, but that's a discussion for another day. It's uh, too many different species, and we have specialists here from captive facilities. I'd like to add that as a basic scientist, there are certain questions I cannot answer without using certain animal models. I personally work with mice, lab mice. I study mammalian sperm development and function. You cannot get sperm from a cell culture. I also said I thought there were too many people on the planet. That is true. But the other problem is that the Western world is seeing a catastrophic fertility collapse and we don't know what it is that has caused the, the quality of sperm in Western men, industrialized men, to tank. So I'm in a, in a position where as much as I am aware of the fact that the dignity of a captive wild animal is stripped from it in many ways, I personally use uh, captive lab mice in, in, in ethical ways supervised by you know, uh, protocols that are very strict. 
um, but I just wanted to put that on the table and I couldn't mo do my work without using these mice. I'll end by saying that humans are our best model organism and I would urge all of you to volunteer to participate in biomedical studies. We need volunteers. I volunteer for studies. If you don't want animals to be used, that's a clear option. Thank you. I agree. I agree. I think that all conservation efforts require human intervention. Um, conservation is necessary because the real harm that mankind is causing to wildlife and to wild places, we are in the Anthropocene epoch. Because of human intervention and human action, there's really very little left in the world that can be considered wild. I also believe in the value of animals connected to man. I believe that having pets, dogs and cats, is appropriate and enriches both the lives of those animals and the people that interact with them. I also believe in zoos and aquariums. We talked about people being inspired and the number of scientists and biologists and veterinarians I know who tell their story back to a connection they made as a kid, seeing, hearing, smelling these animals. Those connections aren't something that we have a way to recreate in media. And certainly, it's not that we have the wild and the cities. We're all part of the earth. And we need to understand that there's no distinction. And if there is a distinction, it's arbitrary. Certainly, when folks are concerned about the animals in zoos and aquariums, I'd like to reassure them that, like the regulations you need to follow with the lab animals that you work with, I'm part of a team of folks that's dedicated to giving good quality care to the animals that are in our care. And it's not just veterinarians. It's veterinarians, it's nutritionists, it's behaviorists, it's people that really made a career because they cared about animals and they felt that having animals in zoos and aquariums was the right way to do things to sort of advance conservation focuses. I can assure you, as a veterinarian, I took an oath, and that oath was to first do no harm. I definitely weigh the harm that is done every single day when I'm looking at global questions of conservation as well as animals in captivity. And I take that oath very seriously. I want to make sure the animals in captivity are giving the best quality care they can be given. Thank you. John. So we are in the middle of a crisis. And I think to, to address the crisis, we need all the tools in, that, we, uh, that we have now and some new tools that we haven't even developed. And so I want to give an example of um, the vaquita. And I don't know. How many of you have heard about vaquita is a very small porpoise that is only found in the northern uh, Gulf of California. In our best estimates now, are there are something less than 20 of these animals left on the planet. There's an issue with the bycatch of vaquita in gill nets. And so recently, there was an effort put together um, by a broad range of veterinarians, including my colleague on my, my right here from SeaWorld and also the Navy and some others, to go out and try to uh, capture some of the last vaquita because they are going fast. And I, I completely applaud this effort. And I believe that some of the knowledge that's gained in their everyday activities, you know, taking care of, of marine mammals, were absolutely vital to working on that effort. Unfortunately, so far, has not worked, but, but I think there's an example where th you can take the knowledge from being able to take care of animals in captivity, and this is a, just an absolute you know, desperate situation, and we need to take whatever effort we can to, to save Akita. Thank you. Sherman. Yeah, so I don't work with captive animals, but the species that I work on is in captivity quite often, like I mentioned. And so I have maybe a fairly simple way that I looked at, at that particular issue, um, which is that you know, if the welfare of a species and individual can be adequately maintained and met and its needs can be met in captivity, and or drawing the resources for conserving that species, you know, depends on having that particular member in captivity. And 
educating people who actually matter in conserving that species is facilitated, is, you know, a, is crucial, and it depends on those individuals being in captivity. If those three conditions are met, I think you can justify keeping an animal in captivity. If those conditions aren't met, then one has to ask, again, why is that animal there? Um, so in, you know, in many facilities that do make efforts to actually translate the presence of those individual animals to conservation in the wild, I applaud those efforts. Um, for other kinds of interventions, um, for instance, you know, bringing in orphans as a result of other kinds of um, human activities, that, you know, again, has, it's very tricky. It can have positive impacts, and it can also have negative impacts on those very same animals. For instance, when they're released, if they're too habituated to people, that can create problems because then they can go out seeking human attention, which can get them in trouble. Um, so mentioned the you know capturing for captive breeding purposes when populations are so tiny, so a parallel situation with Sumatran rhinoceros. Um, the fear of taking action and the consequences of you know some you know something terrible happening, for instance, an animal dying. That would you know if you have only a handful of individuals in the wild, that's a that's a big that's a big cost and it's a huge pressure. And and but on the other hand, you could do nothing and just wait until they all die out. Um, so is that better? I mean, there are forests in there with uh, now in Southeast Asia with maybe 10, 20, God knows, like how many rhinoceros out there? And you know, are we just going to wait until they all get hunted out? So where the costs and benefits are a lot more equal, of course, it gets a lot more tricky. And each of those interventions has to be weighed very carefully on a case by case basis. And I don't think you can make generalizations about those situations. Thank you. Kostov. I mean, you, the, the bottom line for me is you can't save what you don't understand. And to do biology, there's got to be some amount of impact on the species you're studying. Uh, we don't work with captive animals, but we do genetics, which means we have to sample some individuals of a population. Uh, we want to know what kinds of microbes are associated with these, uh, these animals, which means we have to sacrifice them to look in their gut. That's part of understanding the biology of this, uh, but you also have to do it ethically. You also have to do it within the guidelines uh, that are set by individual uh, parks and reserves, and we follow them very stringently. We only use the minimum number of individuals that we need to do a study. Uh, <clears throat> we work strictly within the permit guidelines. Um, st in California, they're, they're very strict, uh, at least set by the state of California. Uh, and in other parts of the world, many parts of the world, too, not everywhere. So I think, yes, there's going to be an impact uh, if you have to do the science. We can't do it without it, but you need to be ethical about it, and you need to minimize your footprint um, in, while you're doing that work. Thank you. Oliver. I think the situation with the Sumatran rhinoceros is really sad. Maybe there are 20 animals left. I've been watching the situation. I remember when there were 1,200, when there were 800, when there were 200. The situation with the Rakita is really sad. In the news um, recently, and probably there's going to be more news about this, the last male northern white, northern white rhinoceros is uh, said to be ailing, and he's in his 40s. And this is a form of rhinoceros uh, that is already functionally extinct. For the last 30 years, every chance we had to get a skin biopsy from a northern white rhinoceros, we did. And we have 12 cell cultures in the frozen zoo that could be the only, live, will be the only living material left from northern white rhinos. But we're going to try to save the species from cell cultures using stem cell technology. We've already shown that you can make induced pluripotent stem cells from northern white rhinoceroses, my colleagues at the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, and uh, our lab showed that. We now have nine northern white rhino individuals that we have induced pluripotent stem cells from. 
We know that we can direct those cells along lines of development. We've already shown that we can take those stem cells and make beating heart cells, cardiomyocytes with them. But what we want to do is make the cells that make eggs and sperm and produce, use those eggs and sperm to make embryos by in vitro fertilization and transfer those embryos to southern white rhino surrogate mothers who would give birth to northern white rhinos. And if that sounds fanciful or amazing, it, yeah, I agree. But it's been done with the mouse. And it's interesting that this is a project that's really risky, that might not succeed, that's going to take a long time, that's going to be expensive. And San Diego Zoo is paying for it. They're taking the risk to do this. And it's interesting, you know, why didn't we choose something easier? And I think the reason was is because this stared us in the face and we could say, no, this is too hard. You know, it might not work. But if we walk away from it, we're sort of acquiescing in, an ex in, the, in the extinction. We're the people we think that can do it. So I guess that, uh, I, I guess that, uh, that this is an extreme example of intervention. But I believe that you have to weigh interventions heavily, you know, in order to prevent extinctions. Thank you. So now if you have questions, you can pass those index cards to the aisles and um, we will come and collect those for you um, while the panelists are answering our final uh, pre-circulated question, which is, there's little doubt that we live in an era of intense political polarization that is particularly divisive when it comes to animal rights issues. Can you think of an original way for us to achieve civil discourse about animal conservation in this climate. We'll start with Shannon again, and again, the panelists will have a maximum of two minutes. Um, I think the bottom line is there is no silver bullet. Um, there is no one way that we're going to solve all of these issues. Um, education is extremely key, and that's education within ourselves, um, us as a first world country, it's education in communities that have no reason to value animals or conservation because their, their livelihood is just living day to day. They see these animals in a different way than we do. And, and perhaps it's teaching them ways to value the animals and show that, you know, a photo, maybe a photo safari um, will help to feed their family because they are being hired by that, that um, sanctuary or that um, land. So they're, they're getting their, their jobs from the community. Um, and photo safari will mean more to them in the long run than going and killing and poaching that animal. It's giving them ways to, to increase their livelihood long term versus short. And that's, that's just education for some of um, the surrounding communities of the land where these animals live. Um, you know, it's about leaving a better planet for future generations and leaving better people, better children for our planet. You know, we all have to, to live here and work together and, and hope that there is a better tomorrow. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about needing to see these animals to care about them. But, you know, we, countries go to war over religion, and that's not something we can see or, or touch. It's something that, that we believe in, and we know is, is what, we be, what we believe is something that we will fight for. And I went over to Africa to fight for these animals without having seen them and knowing what is right and knowing what I stood for and what I believe in. So... Um, and I think changing our laws to support the work and to support these animals and seeing them in a different way, it's, it's extremely important. And it's something that in this climate is going to be very hard, but we're all going to keep trying. And, 
and listening and hopefully working together and, um, and considering all options as we move forward. Thank you. Pascal. So I think most of us know people who we, we love and like, but we just hate what their beliefs and their, their views of certain things. And I think that ought to tell us that if we turn things around and when we meet people who have these outrageous views, um, if we try to find a place, and to, if we try to even have the opportunity to start a discussion rather than just being outraged at each other, looking for those, those things about us, those little specks of humanity that might overlap, and starting there might be a, a chance to first find out that you actually like someone even though they voted or they did something you did absolutely not like. Because if you start from the disagreement, if you confront somebody who's a trophy hunter or somebody who is a farmer who just killed your favorite wild animal, you'll never get to that point. You will start at, at the wrong end of the discussion. But I know this is much, much easier said than done. Um, I try to think back uh, of my favorite people who disagree with me when I meet someone that I really disagree with. But I find myself very often incapable of not shifting into outrage. So as a, a possible slightly original tactic, I would suggest that you always amply ridicule yourself. And when an insult, the first insult comes your way, rather than insulting back, you use that insult to continue to ridicule yourself and focus on that shared humanity. And maybe you stay in the discussion rather than you know, losing control of it altogether. Thank you. Judy. I think what's important is, even if we disagree, there are similar foundations for all of us. Here at this table, although we certainly have different philosophies and approaches to how do we address the issues of animals and animal conservation, I think we'd all agree that we think animal conservation is critical. And not just animal conservation, but habitat conservation, global conservation. And speaking to Dr. Ryder's sort of message of hope, there are ways where or organizations that normally would be on very different sides of the fence are coming together. When we talk about the actions that happened with the vaquita, we had folks from zoos and aquariums we had government officials from the US and Mexico. We had folks from Sea Shepherd. And we were all working together towards a common goal. That was a project that's not going to end up, in retrospect, being something that we look at as being successful. But when we're looking for ways for people to come together to address a common goal, I think the Vaquita is a great example. Because we were able to put aside our differences because fundamentally, we all had the same goal in mind. And if we can think about that as we discuss these concerns with others, it's going to make a world of difference. Thank you. So I want to continue on the Vaquita as a specific for this. And civil discourse certainly did take place between the Mexican government and various NGOs. And, and pretty much there's a consensus that people would like to save this, this porpoise. But there's no civil discourse with the Mexican mafia, the Mexican drug lords, mm. right? And that's the essence of why there is continued fishing there. And if Fakita, so, so there are limits to civil discourse. And at this point, if Fakita are gonna be saved, it's because the Mexican Navy, Sea Shepherd, other people go out and enforce an absolute ban on gill nets in the habitat of Fakita. So yes, civil discourse happened. Yes, it's awesome that so many people came together and agreed. In the end, that doesn't do it. It's just raw force of you go out and say, this area, there will be no gill nets. That's it. There's a limit to civil discourse. Thank you. Sherman. Yeah, I think um, you know we all form our opinions over our accumulated lifetime of experiences. So it's very unlikely that one conversation, one argument is going to change anyone's minds. But I think the goal there with those conversations is that you know everything adds up, right? And you may you have repeated conversations and repeated impressions and repeated things that you read. And for me, I think 
those golden rules that were set out for this, you know, for this panel and for this um, event, you know, those are those are fantastic rules um, to try to live by. Um, it's very difficult <laughs> to to contain outrage. Um, but I, I think one of the most critical things, though, for me that I see all around in any conversation is that um, we le listen and listen well and s actually listen more than we speak. Because quite often people are just interested in stating their position and their argument and aren't actually really interested in what the other side has to say. And you, if you're not interested, then you're not going to understand and you're not going to have empathy. So. Um, you know, there should be, you know, there should be a genuine attempt to listen and understand. And I'd say that's the key. And unfortunately, discussions that happen on places like, you know, social media and online don't, <laughs> are, the, are the worst examples of this. And in media, um, actually, I don't see media as contributing very much to civil discourse, unfortunately, in the way that people report on things that are very sensitive. Um, so most recently, you know, the trophy hunting Reverse the you know the allowing um, ivory back into the U.S. that was trophy hunted. Um, the headlines on that they're they're already very um, sort of sensationalist and the opposite of <laughs> of civil discourse I'd say and they sort of elicit emotional reactions from people and people react without actually looking more deeply into what's going on and understanding it. So that doesn't help. So I think before we react, we should try to understand. And to understand, we should try to listen. Thank you. Costa, yeah, I, I, I want to continue on the vein that Sherman set up there. Um, if you think about it, conservation is ultimately about human values. And human values differ across cultures, differ across societies. And you know, one of the one of the criticisms that have been leveled against conservation in the past is that much of the conservation action in the past have been elitist. And there's truth to that. Uh, outsiders come in and say, you can't do this, or you can't do that. So the first step in, have, in order to have a dialogue is you have to engage the people um, who live with the animals that you're trying to conserve, the existence you're trying to conserve. And the other thing that's been missing from that dialogue is, and we have been particularly bad at um, formulating as to why you want to save it. Um, again, values differ. Um, and one of the things that's coming up in conservation more and more is this concept of ecosystem services. Uh, having a functioning ecosystem benefits everybody, so if you start taking it down, then we all pay the price. And I think that's a currency that most people can understand. And that's currency that you can start to have a dialogue that gets beyond you know, individual values, because then it becomes a situation where it be, it's, it's sort of we're all in the commons, and it's the survival of the commons. Thank you. Oliver. I don't really think that I have too much that's original to say. But what I found uh, is when you uh, uh, if you can find an occasion to talk with somebody and have them share a personal story about their an early formative relationship with nature, um, you can begin to move in on that common ground and find a place uh, to have a shared sense of wonder or appreciation that can form the basis then for expanding a conversation. My colleagues at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research, there's a group that's, that's called Community Engagement. And they work in, in several places in the world, uh, immediately comes to mind Peru and uh, Kenya, with communities that, whose lives are impacted by the, uh, the wildlife, the species that, we're, uh, that we have an um, interest in conserving. And that's a more humble approach. We're trying to you know, start from the standpoint of recognizing that, that uh, they could have decimated or destroyed those species in the way that, that we did many of those to many species that, that we had uh, as we uh, colonized North America, that is, uh, you know, the United States was formed. 
So that's, uh, that's not an original approach, but one that is probably essential to, to because uh, habitats where you have animals basically at unnatural densities, uh, you know, within their former range are, are, are not the functional ecosystems that we want to preserve species in. And just to wind up with the Vaquita, this community engagement group spent a couple of years working in San Felipe where the Vaquita, the largest human population adjacent to where the Vaquita are localized lived. And they, they worked with school kids and through the school kids were able to, to get public opinion surveys. And there were a lot of, and talked to them about the Vaquita. And there were a lot of people who wanted to save the Vaquita. But one of the successes of the, the approach was that we got honest civil discourse. Some people said, we can't wait till they go extinct so that we can get back to fishing. So, uh, and I guess I should, I guess I'd just like to say too that the efforts to capture Vaquita have stopped, but two were captured and their cells are in the frozen zoo. Thank you. All right, so now we have a chance to turn to questions from the audience. And thank you for your attention up to this point. Um, I have been able to feel your sincere listening, um, which uh, Dr. De Silva talked about being essential for civil discourse, and I appreciate that. Some of the questions that you've submitted um, have uh, been touched upon. Uh, one of you asked about importing uh, elephant trophies and the um, presidential administration's shifting position on this. Another asked about um, how organizations and people, despite different political beliefs, can work together. And I think the case study that we've been talking about um, has helped to address that. One question, though, that we haven't asked is about sort of the nature of the human animal. And this is sort of a long question, but it's really good. One constant that has popped up during your responses is the notion that we as humans are the root cause of the plight facing animal life through our greed and misguided beliefs on animal conservation. And yet, greed is one of the staples of humanity. How do we attempt to overcome our greed and belligerence when we are so naturally greedy and belligerent? So now we have a sort of free uh, for all. Anyone who would like to chime in on that question is welcome to do so. And um, I know the students that are leaving are leaving because they have to go to class and our campus is large. So thank you for, for being here. So who'd like to take this question? Any thoughts on that? I think you actually did a good job sort of talking about the environmental currency um, because we do need people to understand the economic value to conservation. When we can create a case study where it's obvious that these animals and the biodiversity that they help to provide has a value to us both locally and globally, it makes a difference. The sad thing is we shouldn't have to justify everything by money, but in reality we often do. And so when I look at effective conservation programs across the globe, many of them are designed to say, okay, here's the economic drivers creating these threats to conservation. Here's how we can change things by educating women or girls or creating economic opportunities or um, doing things so that the conservation of the animals in the habitat is part of the growth of the community. It's not a be all and end all, but certainly it's one approach to the problem. Yeah, Pascal. Or, or Sherman and then Pascal. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I mean, I, I think fundamentally, again, coming back to the big picture of, you know, things have been evolving and going extinct for a very long time, ultimately, you know, if we want to be greedy, we can be greedy, and we can just be one of those species that goes out of, you know, blinks out of existence. So fundamentally, that's the bottom line. And you know, we can, I think, for, for some of us, we'll we'll be able to make arguments um, on moral or ethical or spiritual grounds, and that'll resonate. But for others, we'll have to just make these plain old simple dollars and cents kinds of arguments, and you know, arguments based on self-interest. Um, one thing, though, that I want I, that I think we should be very careful about, and all of us um, here, is that you know, we should 
we can speak in generalities, but really the rubber meets the road in specifics, um, in the specific context, in the specific instances where we're working. You know, it, every situation is different. So we can talk about, for instance, ecotourism and the benefits that they provide, and you know, and how much you know income or revenue a community can get. But where I work, the national park that I work is tiny. It's about 16 kilometers wide. It has one entrance on the southern side, and all of those benefits basically go to people who live within a small a few kilometers of that entrance, nobody else benefits. And the people who have the money to actually, you know, the urban elites who have the money to invest in opening up hotels and, and whatnot. So the costs are distributed somewhere else. The people who have to endure the crop rating and, and you know, the, the threats to life and limb all around the park. And the benefits are distributed somewhere totally different. So the costs and benefits don't line up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in those concrete instances, we have to deal with the actual problem. Um, and so, you know, the answer to the greed question, yeah, there's a lot of greed out there. There's a lot of money to be made. Um, and in each specific instance, we, I think we have to look for what leverage and what we, you know, what, what knobs and whistles and, you know, things we have to work with in addressing the very specific problems in the very specific context. Okay. Pascal, did you want to, or Christoph? I know Christoph has to leave to teach, so I'm going to actually let you. I mean, yeah, if I could follow up, on, it's a great question, and yeah, greed's always going to be there. And you know, for me, in that context, I think it, it's helpful to make the difference difference between conservation and sustainability. Um, there was a commission put together, the Brundtland Commission, many years ago, which defined sustainability as not unlike conservation. Sustainability allows you to take things from nature. But it, uh, it only says that you need to only take things that harvest it in a sustainable way so that the next generation also has something to take. And so that, I think, is the big difference. And in, in it, it plays out in fisheries in a big way. You know, greed ultimately leads to collapse of fisheries. And if the fishery collapses, then the people who are dependent on that fishery have nothing to go by. But the new policies that uh, are playing out in places like Alaska essentially does not say you can't take it. You can still fish, but you need to fish it within limits. And I think that's where the science comes in. And we have done a pretty poor job of figuring out what those limits are. But with better science, and again, the more of an evidence-based uh, approach there could, could help in that, yes, people will take things. And some of it is absolutely necessary to feed 10 billion people in the middle of the century. It's just going to have to be done. But how do we do it so that these things don't completely collapse? And that's the big challenge. Thank you. Pascal. I wanted to address a type of you know, moral greed or greed for the cathedral to yourself. Uh, John Muir, who you know, we have a college named after him, famously saw the wild as this you know, cathedral that you're supposed to visit and be in awe. But he also contributed to removing the people who lived in the cathedral. And so you have places like Tanzania now where you can plug in greed. They actually make more money from safari tourism than from the gold they export for the first time last year. It's one of the major gold exporters. But again, where do the benefits go? If you ask the Maasai who were just thrown out of a part of the Serengeti, they don't see that money from the, from the tourists. So sometimes I think you could operationalize greed but especially if you're from the privileged part of the world, using all the energy, flying over there with the jet to see your favorite animal, it's really tricky um, telling people what they ought to do so that you can enjoy your wildlife. Yeah, John. So humans are social, and that could be a key. If, you know, if I'm going to go out and put my net in or shoot an animal, it's all about me, right? But if there's some impact that ties into the whole community and I'm tied into the community, that may be a lever where I will, won't do it because there's enough pressure or there's enough you know, damage to the community. I think that's, that's where if there is a future for keeping human greed in, in check, it's where we're part of some community as opposed to just out for ourselves. Do any other panelists want to chime in on this question before we move on? Okay, Just briefly, um, I agree with the questioner uh, that human greed is very difficult to contain. It's very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, a fact of, of human history. Um, it has uh, been contained. I mean, it's it's possible to to attenuate it 
socially with social pressure and with laws and I suppose with with aspects of civilization and I don't think we ought to give up on trying to establish an order uh, that uh, values uh, right sharing more than it uh, uh, um, uh, uh, acquiesces uh, in greed. Good. Oh, yeah, please, Shannon. Um, you know, we're putting programs in place that have started to be very effective. And, um, you know, you mentioned the Maasai Mara uh, or the Maasai tribe. And traditionally, they would go out and hunt and kill lions. But now they're actually being monetarily rewarded to protect the same lions. So you know, if you find, if you find ways to create these programs so that the people still have a way to sustain themselves, there's a, an enormous religion called the Shimbi religion. Um, there's about 9 million members. And traditionally, they use leopard skins. Um, in their tribal dancing. And once um, we figured this out, we've been able to go in and talk to the church, we not being me, but I know the story of it, and um, go in and talk to the church and give them alternative ways to do what they're doing and actually gain a profit for it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been some beautiful fake skins have been created because there just are not enough leopards left in the world for them to sustain what they're doing. And you create these fake skins and you let the church benefit from that by selling it to their members and their people. And you, you start to create other forms of, of money. So for them, it's, it's not necessarily greed. It's just so they can survive. And so as we come up with these programs for them, it very much gives them an alternative way to survive without it meaning compromising the earth, the animals, and the planet. Great, and that's a great segue to uh, our next audience question, which is uh, uh, on the theme of hope, which has been discussed. Um, are we seeing positive changes, uh, some like what Shannon just described, and in what ways? It's a concern how quiet we are here <laughs> to that question. It really is. And, and certainly, I think everyone at this table works hard every day to try to create the kind of scenarios where hope makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I can think of some small gains. And we have to take solace in those small gains. Because without the small gains, we'll never make the big ones. So while we're very quiet, I think all of us can come up with small examples. We'd like to come up with big ones, but that's where the audience has the opportunity to be part of the solution in the future. Committed conservationists love it when they can make more converts. And your involvement, investment, and intervention can take us from our small gains to big gains. I'll give you one. So so I've been uh, teaching here for several decades. And so when I first got here, people are applying to graduate school to oceanography. And often the applications, you know, if you go back three decades ago, the statement of, of purpose says basically, you know, I want to go out and learn something about the ocean. And it didn't go too much past that. Now, almost every application says, I want to go out and learn something about the ocean and then apply that knowledge in some positive way. I mean, across the board, the people going into uh, graduate school now, it's not just about living in the ivory tower. It's about, I want to learn something and I want to make the world a better place because there is the sense that, you know, there's a crisis. So that's a glimmer of hope in the sense that I think you guys, you know, who are now coming into your education and jobs and all of that, I think you do care more than people cared 30 years ago. Thank you. Yeah. Oliver. So, yeah, I, I, I think that there's some, there's some small examples. 
and um, but they're good examples. And maybe they're larger examples. Um, remember that this whole panel here talked about the Anthropocene. So, you know, it's, it, uh, I think that we look from the standpoint of, again, talking to those people in the future. They will say everything we saved was a success. They were, you know, so the hope that we can do that is important. I want to tell you a small story. It's a small mouse that's critically endangered, that lives north of here uh, in Camp Pendleton and uh, on the Dana Point headlands. And uh, it was emergency listed as an endangered species. It was thought to be extinct. It's called the small Pacific pocket mouse. And it weighs as much as three pennies. It's this big, um, amazing animal, totally amazing animal. And uh, we've been working with it for, for a number of years. And there we, the way to, because these populations that it persists in, there's, there are only three populations that survive and they're very small, the idea to save it was to create some additional populations. But there were none of the populations that were big enough to draw animals out to use to translocate to a new site. Because you don't just move a few animals. That's we know that that doesn't work. You have to put out a large number of animals for them to establish a new population. So a captive breeding program was started for these little mice. And, uh, uh, and a, at, at a place called the Laguna Wilderness Park off the toll road uh, in the um, uh, Irvine Ranch area, there's an experimental reintroduction. And these mice that were produced by interbreeding the separate populations quite controversially because they were genetically distinct. Well, it turns out that the females of one population didn't have any preference for males from their own population. They were quite happily mated with males of the other population. And those animals are reproducing like mad. We ha we're taking now talking about taking down the fence because they are um, uh, they're, num they're at such a high high density. So, you know, they, they, the the amount of rainfall that happens. There's lots of fluctuations. You know, uh, uh, can this work in the long run? Um, you know, we're scientists and we know that there's there's you have to speak in terms of probability. But I think that's a success. And really quickly, one more. The world's most impactful environmental legislation to conserve species is the United States Endangered Species Act. And it was enacted by, in Richard Nixon's administration by an overwhelming vote uh, uh, in, the, in, the in, the, in the House of Representatives. The Senate was a little tougher. Um, but it hasn't been repealed. In spite of all of the efforts or concerns about it, in our society, it has withstood the assaults on this piece of legislation, and which, is, which are not over. But we have, uh, it's a hopeful, we have hope that we can preserve it, and it is a very important piece of legislation that protects species in our country. Okay. Sherman and then Pascal. Um, so, small story, because I haven't been in this business as much as long as some of the other people here have, but so, um, small anecdote, I have a great sort of hope that, um, you know, as with every generation, you know, places hope in the future generations, I hope that in some of the areas where we're working, um, you know, the sort of front lines of conservation, that the generations that are coming up are more aware and better, educa better educated and have whole different values than the preceding ones. And an example of that is just quite simply hunting for subsistence. Um, in, in one farmer that, I, that we spoke with in the area where I work, quite openly, you know, he, he, he used to hunt and it's just something that is, you know, everybody would do, even though it's now illegal, um, people still do it. Um, but his children, 
didn't, didn't approve of it. And so, and I've heard this story from other contexts, in African contexts and other Asian contexts as well. So basically, he wasn't allowed to hunt anymore. And he wasn't allowed not only to hunt, but they'd gone completely vegetarian. So they weren't eating any meat because they'd had a pet cow. <laughs> and, and now they're, they're, you know, they're viewing animals in a very different way than, than people did before a generation earlier. You know, they're, they're seeing them as pets more, as, you know, as not, uh, less as something to eat and consume. Um, or as a livestock. So um, that one little story, and I think that that's actually not that atypical. I think that's repeated over and over again, multiply that hundredfold, thousandfold, millionfold, and I hope that we'll, we'll see a sea change. Thank you, and I think Pascal gets the last word. <laughs> no pressure. So humans are a profoundly cultural animal, and uh, one amazing thing about cultures is that they can create norms, but these norms can change. And I'm aware of a huge effort by people affiliated with Save the Elephants in Kenya, with uh, Ian Douglas Hamilton, to reach out to celebrities in China, including people like Jackie Chan and musicians, to make ivory uncool. And one beauty about culture is it can be inherited upwards from the young to the old, very much like this example. And so steps to change something like making ivory on cool in a new generation of Chinese might, might have more impact than any automatic weapon or patrols you can imagine. And uh, I see glimmers of hope in that. Well, Shannon, yeah, sure. Um, I think we all do what we do because we all have hope. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be doing any of this work. Um, I think collaboration is really key moving forward. Um, there's a lot of competition out there, and I think that's stopping a lot of progress. My, my hope for you guys leaving today is to educate yourselves as much as you possibly can on any of the topics that you're interested in, to share that. And whether you're sharing it uh, with your friends on social media, you're going out and exploring in the world, you're talking to, to anyone that has knowledge on the topic, I think it's, it's imperative that, that we all start working together and helping each other. And you know the vibration of the earth is rising, and so are we. And we must rise with it. And I think we're all seeing more value in the planet, in the people, in the animals. And um, that's going to make us all better, better humans moving forward. So hopefully we can all work together in the future. And thank you guys so much for being here. That's excellent. Thank you. That's a great way to end it. The video from this panel will be posted on the Burles website. If you search Burles, B-E-A-R-L-S, it's the only thing that comes up because it's a word we made up. Um, and the video will be posted there. And also the remaining questions, because we did have some excellent questions, um, I'm going to send those to the panelists and post any answers that I receive um, on the website as well, or the link to, to those answers. Thank you very much to our seven panelists. This was amazing for me. I hope it was amazing for all of you as well. And thank you again for being here.